Hi, you're listening to the Wall Street Oasis podcast, a podcast about breaking into the world of finance, along with interviews with those who have. I'm Alex Grodnick, your host. And before we jump into today's episode, it might be useful to know a bit about who I am. So here it goes. I'm currently a second year MBA student at UCLA. Prior to school, I worked for JP Morgan's private wealth group before hustling my way into investment banking where I was part of Houlihan Loki's restructuring group. After banking, I went on to work for a digital media company that owns all sorts of fun websites and even created the apps for the Kardashian sisters. And now, as I get close to finishing up B-School and I reflect on the purpose of life and what the hell I'm going to do with mine, I started the podcast called The Virtual MBA Show, where we talk about life at top business schools, what it's really like, along with some great conversations I get to have with students, recent grads, and even some CEOs. Patrick and the guys at Wall Street Oasis heard my podcast. I guess they must have liked it. And now the plan is to create some awesome podcasts for all the monkeys out there on Wall Street Oasis. So that's what we're going to do. If you have any comments or suggestions or stuff you'd like to hear, please email me, alex at wallstreetoasis.com. And yeah, let's jump into our first episode. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a Netflix for finance? Well, there is. It's called Real Vision, and it gives you unprecedented access to some of the most respected names in finance. Watch interviews with legends like Kyle Bass, Jeff Gunlock, Stanley Drunkenmiller, and many, many more. If you want to be part of the Real Vision revolution, visit realvision.com slash WSO. Today, we are speaking with none other than the founder and chief monkey of Wall Street Oasis, Patrick Curtis. That's correct. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. So for everyone who doesn't know what Wall Street Oasis is, let me give a couple of sentences on that and then we'll jump right into your super interesting background. Sounds good. So you have this, I call it a finance blog. It's probably much more, but it's a... um, a website with a mission to serve as an entertaining and useful place for people in finance to come together, communicate, share useful information. Uh, it's one of the largest finance communities on the web. There's like something like a million unique visitors a month. And you give uh, on there, there's advice sections and lifestyle surrounding working 100 hours a week. And you give resume help and interviewing tips. And there's interesting uh, information on groups and how much they pay. So all of that, right? Yeah, that's correct. You nailed it. Um, great. So we'll get way more into that and how it came to be. But let's uh, let's start off here at uh, after undergrad. So you you're you have an MBA from from Wharton, but even before that, let's talk about fill us in. Where do you go to school and what happened right after school? Sure. So I'm originally from the Boston area. I grew up in Massachusetts my whole life. Ended up staying close to um, close to home. Went to Williams College out in uh, Williamstown, Mass. Kind of middle of nowhere, but a beautiful area. Loved it there. Um, ended up being an economics major, and I can tell you, I didn't even know what investment banking was or really any finance careers. In my junior year, I was actually an assistant manager at a yoga studio. Believe it or not, um, my junior year. So everyone now is is freaking out about internships and. I didn't even have a, a banking internship, yet alone know mu- much about what even banking was at the time. And this is back in 2002. So it was also um, a very difficult time. It was right after 9-11. Um, so it was, you know, obviously the economy was, was in a free fall. It was just a very bad time. A lot of um, companies had canceled coming onto campus. And eventually I kind of got around to figuring out what this whole investment banking thing was and realized that I was way behind in terms of uh, preparation. Luckily enough, um, Williams has, especially for the percentage of, stu- of uh, number of students actually targeting investment banking, has a, a pretty good placement rate um, onto the street just because there's there happens to be a strong alumni base there. So I lucked out in that sense. Um, I, I was able to get a, a full-time offer from uh, Rothschild in their New York office and where I worked for a few years. Um, so I don't know if that's covering everything you wanted to know about my college career. 
Yeah. I mean, well, let's take the rest of the podcast and talk about yoga. I think that's what people would be most <laughs> interested. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's perfect. I share your sentiments. I graduated from undergrad in 09 and mm-hmm. our career fair was the day after Bear Stearns collapsed. Wow. So not, not a the lot best timing, of, not the best timing for either of us, but we both made it work. So you didn't have an internship, but you got the full-time job. Then you're at Rothschild starting day one. You kind of have an idea what banking is. So what happened next? Sure. I think it was a, a, a fairly difficult transition for me. Um, and when I first started at Rothschild, um, well, one of the coolest things was they actually, um, before I even started, they uh, flew me out to Rome to play in one of their soccer tournaments, which as you can imagine, as like a senior in college, you think it's the coolest thing ever. You know, we ended up at one of the Rothschild castles for like a party. And, and to me, this is like the coolest thing ever, you know, um, got to play on Lazio, Lazio's an Italian club, got to play on their like professional fields. And it was just such an incredible experience. And it was kind of, um, uh, one of the highlights I think of, of actually getting the job. So, it was kind of funny that that was before the job and then I started the job and, and, you know, there's training and whatnot, but, you know, coming from Williams college, it's, it's a liberal arts background and had no accounting background, no finance background, hadn't done any of these financial modeling training programs. So I was a little bit lost and especially compared to, um, a lot of the analysts that had, you know, came from Wharton and whatnot, but there was a, a decent percentage of the class that came from liberal arts. So I wasn't, you know, completely alone, but, um, so it was, it was a tough transition, especially I'd say the first three to six months by, you know, month five or six, I would say that I was fully ramped up, you know, was able to crank out models. I'd actually transitioned over to the restructuring group by, uh, I think it was around month three. Um, and given the time of, uh, the time that I had joined, it was, it was a great time for restructuring. There was a ton of deal flow, you know, it was 02 to 04. So you can imagine, um, and so I was getting, it wasn't really pitch work. I was actually working on deals. So um, that was interesting. I was flying to Mexico for one client. I was you know, traveling to St. Louis for others. And it was um, an incredible learning experience for me. It was incredibly difficult, um, you know, lifestyle wise. Uh, I was working um, kind of an obscene number of hours each week. Um, that being said, I, th- I felt like once after those first initial six months, it kind of even though it was longer hours, it was less stressful because I knew what I was doing at that point. So, right, that's the it's a six month to one year kind of ramp up for banking analysts. But as you say, there are plenty of upsides. I mean, the learning is incredible. You travel to Rome to play soccer. Uh, there's all sorts of of good parts that come with working in insane hours. Yeah. And I think it was, it was also, you learn a lot about yourself um, and your priorities. You kind of step back. And I think one of the things, um, when you, when you push yourself, you know, I had pushed myself through high school and through college in terms of feeling like, Oh, I'm balancing so many things. I have all these clubs, but when you're actually in the office for, you know, consistently 80 hours a week, week after week, after week, after week, and, you know, sometimes getting up to a hundred hours a week, you really, you start to question a lot, but you also kind of can find out how far you can push yourself. Um, you know, there's a point I think where a lot of analysts reach, they're just exasperated and they, they, they really ask themselves, do I want to do this long term? And that's why I think you see some of the retention is- issues you're seeing with some of the investment banks. But, you know, if people can make it through that and they still want to be there, um, long term and they enjoy the client work, I think it's, it's an incredible career. So, but I think you, you learn a lot about yourself and I think any other job you go to after kind of going through those two years, um, in, in my mind, it's going to be kind of a cakewalk, even entrepreneurship where the hours can be brutal. So, Right. It's a great investment banking. I mean, it's really unrivaled in terms of a starting place for the beginning of your career. Not only does it give you amazing experience and great learnings, but you also get paid pretty well. So that's also nice. It is nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a nice perk, especially, uh, you know, after, you know, getting that number, that bonus number after a full kind of year of, of slaving away, I feel like is it at least makes, it, it takes the sting off a little bit for sure. Right. So while you're doing all this, all this, uh, demanding work, it sounds like you kind of had a spiritual awakening, an epiphany. What'd you find out about yourself? I felt like, um, I think it was pretty early on. I felt like to me, it was not sustainable in terms of the the path I was going. I felt like I was just losing touch with not just my family, but just good friends. And, um, it was something that especially, you know, 
turning from year one to year two when I was comfortable and I felt like the learning had plateaued a little bit. Um, I was still learning new things and I was still being challenged, but it was much more of a process oriented job for me at that point. It wasn't, uh, yeah, I wasn't learning anywhere near as fast as I was in the first six months. Um, and that's when I kind of started thinking, okay, what are my next steps? And, um, I thought, you know, what's going to make me happy is work. I knew working that, that many hours just wasn't going to make me happy. And I didn't see, um, associates working that, you know, I, I saw them working extremely hard too and being extremely stressed out. So it, it was one of those things I, I started kind of asking around and luckily I had some other co-analysts that knew a lot more than I did in terms of what the traditional exit opportunities were. So, uh, in private equity and hedge funds. So I started, uh, reaching out to recruiters. I started, you know, prepping for those interviews, um, you know, polishing my resume and, and all of those things. And it was, you know, I, I, there were a few analysts that really kind of took me under the weekend wing and associates that, that helped me. Cause I don't think it's an easy process when you're working that many hours to actually fit in any time for preparation. So, um, but in terms of like a spiritual awakening, it was more just learning more about myself and thinking, okay, maybe this isn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And, I think that's a natural progression. Some people just love it. Um, other people just think, you know, this has been great for me in terms of a first step, but I need to try some other things. And some people actually end up going back to banking, but it was, it was one of those things that, look, I may come back as an associate, maybe after an MBA, but I definitely want to try some other things before, um, going to business school. So. Absolutely. So you talked about exit opportunities. They're abundant coming out of, out of banking and the, there's private equity, there's hedge funds. I mean, not to make light of, of those things, they're, they're still very hard to get. But traditionally, the big private equity funds and the big hedge funds, they exclusively hire ex investment banking analysts, right? So these jobs are kind of built for someone like yourself. So is that the path that you took? It is, yeah. So I ended up going to um, into private equity. Um, I actually ended up at a fund in Boston, um, for only a little over six months. And this is one of the probably hardest points in my career where I had moved back to Boston, which is where I wanted to be, uh, my hometown, near my friends, near my family. Um, and I was called into the office um, six months into starting and I was being let go in my first review. <laughs> wow. So um, I was being let go and, and it was, you know, I think, you know, I was very naive at 24 not to kind of have seen it coming. Um, I think there were warning signs in retrospect that I, you know, hindsight 2020, 20, right? Um, but it was kind of a blow just to the, I think, to your ego, to, you know, what could I have done differently? Now, several years later, I, I realized that the fund was actually doing very poorly and was imploding and they ended up getting rid of 75% of the investment professionals. So it just happened to be... I was kind of last in first out, <laughs> um, in that, in that case, but, um, I didn't know that at the time. Right. So it was, it was something that I think kind of really hits your confidence. And I'm sure a lot of people have gone through in the downturns and it, it's not easy. I wanted to stay in Boston in private equity. I found the, the work very interesting. I wasn't able to get a job. I struck out countless times, um, even though I was getting to final rounds, the problem was how do you spin a story where you just started six months ago and basically another private equity firm is saying, no, we don't want you. How do you spin that story? Not knowing that the fund is going under, right? They didn't want to admit that. So, um, you know, that they were hiding that in terms of their LPs and stuff like that as well. So it's one of those, it was one of those very unfortunate situations where I wasn't able to um, spin it well. And luckily I did have people from Rothschild, um, another fellow analyst who went to bat for me and kind of vouched for me as a really hard worker. And I was able to land an interview, um, at Tailwind Capital in New York because of that. And then people, and, and luckily they were able, they were willing to give me a shot. And so that's where I ended up quickly. And within three months or so, I had landed a job back in New York in private equity. And I felt like career wise, I had to take it, right? It was it was um, the only way to kind of stay in the industry I wanted to stay in. Yes, I'd have to go back to New York, but it's not the worst um, not the worst thing in the world, right? So, um, so I went back and I ended up working at Tailwind for almost four years um, before I got my MBA and I got some great deal experience. Really respect all the guys there. So, um, yeah, kind of. I think I lucked out. It was it was a bad situation turned into a decent situation again, one where my network really saved me and just having that good reputation from Rothschild saved me. And how that whole situation worked out, that's 
incredibly lucky. You're incredibly fortunate. Yes. It could've, it could've, <laughs> well, I know, I, I know, I was. I mean, I had a recruiter tell me in Boston, "I don't know what to tell you." He's like, "Everyone loves you until the final round, then they have like a, a reference check or whatnot." And, the, and all tail or all the first firm, my first private equity firm, would say it was, "Yes, he works here, right? No comment." And so that just looks right. horrible. <laughs> so it's like red flags everywhere, and basically, you know, it was impossible. Um, so, you know, I was very straight with the tailwind guys uh, on that situation. And it was, it was interesting because I think a year or two later, kind of it all came out what was happening at that fund and, um, the initial fund. And it was, um, it kind of became a little bit, it, it, it kind of made all, it all made sense at all, the, all the dots connected later on, but, um, not, not before some suffering, I think. Right. So one more question sure. of the, of the pre MBA sort before we kind of get into the business school stuff. Sure. Uh, so during this three month period, when you're scrambling to find another job, did you, were you only focused on private equity? Did you, did you have, you know, ideas of this future? I didn't really. Um, I think the, uh, you know, I had considered hedge funds. I just didn't feel like with my transaction, I really felt like I was having gone into restructuring and done a lot of restructuring deals. I felt like I was fairly well suited for private equity. I mean, you understand the capital structure extremely well. You understand leverage, you understand debt, and you understand how you know returns are generated. So I, I feel like I could speak well to that in an interview. Whereas in hedge funds, I felt like you know, yeah, I traded and stuff, but I didn't have the best investment pitches, right? I didn't have um, any specific trading strategies that I was implementing in my own personal portfolio that I felt was um, going to, you know, wow anyone. You know, I didn't have that confidence um, like I had in um, the the deal experience that I had under my belt. So it, I felt like I hadn't really pivoted my search to hedge funds. I did actually interview with some hedge funds while I was um, at Rothschild. I, I hadn't 100% decided private equity, but I, I felt like it was quickly obvious to me that in the interviews I was, I was much better, um, suited for PE. So, um, but yeah, in terms of entrepreneurship, it hadn't really, um, sunk in. I feel like that experience that I went through from, you know, getting fired so quickly did kind of leave an imprint of, I shouldn't be, um, so dependent and I shouldn't always just assume my job's going to be there if I work hard. Um, that kind of, I think was a little bit of an impetus towards starting wall street oasis, um, but that didn't really start until, um, I was at tail one and it was more just a side project. I would work on it from, you know, when I got home at seven or eight o'clock at night till, you know, 11 midnight or, you know, whatever it felt like, you know, working 60 hours a week on average, it felt like a vacation after coming yeah. in a rough job. You so. had an extra 40 hours to start a side business. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So no, and, and, you know, initially I think there's, I think starting an online business, um, especially back in 2006, you kind of have a little bit of a preconceived notion. Oh, we're going to have this advertising revenue. You have no idea on, in terms of, you know, what CPM, you know, what are CPMs, what are, you know, for, for this type of niche business, what am I actually going to be able to generate and how much traffic I'm going to need? I think there's a little bit of, um, you're a little bit naive in terms of how easy you think it is to, to get advertising revenue. So, um, that it wasn't something that I felt like was going to, um, explode um right away i felt like there was going to be a lot of work and a lot of people say oh how did it you know become a success it was really a gradual process there wasn't any one if you look at our traffic it, there wasn't any one just crazy uptick it was just a steady it was just steady growth from 2006 all the way uh to today so what i will say is is uh, when i was at tail when I, I happened to come across an article it was uh i think it was business uh, 30 under 30 or who does those the Forbes with Forbes magazine or um, business week I'm trying to remember what, uh, but they basically profile 30 entrepreneurs that are under 30 years old and I remember reading through those ideas and thinking to myself well some of these are great and then some of them aren't that spectacular and I was thinking well why can't I start something like this um, so that that article I think was more of a well that's interesting what could I do on the side with a little bit of time, you know, with minimal capital, um, that I'd saved. So I, I quickly kind of, you know, eliminated any sort of manufacturing business, any sort of kind of capital intensive business and thought, well, online seems to be like a great place to be. Um, and you know, minimum, it doesn't take a lot of capital. You can, if you're able to attract enough users, you can potentially have a, a ongoing business. So that's kind of what led me towards, um, led me towards that. So, so you're, 
at Tailwind. Things are going well. You're starting this new internet business. So what's going through your mind now? Why business school? So business school, I had I had a lot of um, I had gained some good deal experience at Tailwind. I'd kind of reached the point where I felt like you know we had gotten to a point where I'd closed some good deals, and um, I felt like if I could go to business school, actually have some time to work on Wall Street Oasis full time, I might actually be able to make the full transition. Um, and I felt like business school was a good place to do that because I'd be surrounded by people who were in the online advertising space, who were in the internet space, who understood. This stuff and and I was right. I think a lot of my cohort mates really helped me take the business to the next level. And then just having the time, having the time to um, improve the platform, having the time to uh, recruit better, you know, get better content, having the time to sell ads or, or you know partner with better ad networks, really kind of took the business to the next level while I was at Wharton. So from 2008 to 2010, and, and Wharton was incredibly, incredibly supportive um, through um, the venture initiation program they have there through, um, uh, I think there's there's another program over the summer where they, they actually um, were helping me with funding as well. So they, they would, just to work on my business, so instead of taking an internship so that I could focus on the business, they were... Um, you know, they would, I won some award, I can't remember what it was called, but it was something like $10,000 over the summer to work on your business. So um, not only were they supportive just from the people there, uh, they were supportive in terms of actually financially as well. So um, that was, that was a huge help for me. And it, I, I really felt, felt like the two years in business school, if things didn't work out, having a award in MBAs and a bad insurance policy, having, you know, I could always go into corporate finance or I could, you know, go back into the, into the financial sphere if I wanted. Um, but if it did work, then I'd have kind of the best of both worlds. I'd be able to travel and, and go where I wanted to go and, um, run my business online. Um, cause I, most of my team was, was abroad and, and all over the place. So it, I felt like I still had that freedom where I wasn't going to be tied down to any one specific area. And that seemed very attractive to me. Right. That whole thought process makes perfect sense. You can go, you can have the Wharton as kind of a hedge. If the site doesn't work, exactly. like you, won't, you won't be able to get a job. If it does work, tremendous upside. So that's what you did. You went to school for two years, worked on growing the website. So tell us the story. How did, how'd it go? What happened? You know, how'd you get to... It was a little bit of a crazy time. If you remember, 2008 to 2010 is when I went to school. So right when I was in school, um, right when you were graduating, right, all this crazy news chain you know, of bear and Lehman and all this stuff started happening. And a lot of people said, Oh, this site's going to be done. And like, this is the worst thing ever for it. And it actually was probably the opposite for it because it was kind of a time where there was a lot of questions. There were a lot of things. There was a lot of anxiety in the industry, obviously a lot of layoffs. Um, and so people were kind of wanted an outlet and they needed an outlet and they needed a place where they could go to get information. And I felt like we kind of provided that platform, um, where, uh, people who come get, you know, get more specifics. Okay. What's happening. And it's actually fascinating. If you look back to 2000, I think early 2008, there was one of our kind of what I call super users. He had kind of predicted the whole thing, um, which was really scary. Very, uh, <laughs> very, uh, unbelievable post, you know, in retrospect, looking at it, um, how he had predicted every, you know, almost to the T what would happen. Um, maybe even surprised him a little bit at the extent of it, but, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the site and, and how it grew, we ended up getting a deal with a good vertical ad network that increased our ad revenue about 5x. So, you know, overnight we were able to kind of um, sell enough of our ad inventory and, and, and at a high enough rate that we could, I immediately said, okay, well, I can live off of this now. It's not something where I'm going to be, you know, taking more than like a 50%, you know, pay cut. Um, so in that sense, it, it quickly became something where I realized I'm going to be able to do this. Um, so it was something more of, you know, it kind of just refocused and rededicated me even more during those two years. And then again, I just tried to leverage all the smart people around me at Wharton as much as I could during that time. And even did some class projects with the business where some of my classmates helped us kind of analyze what was happening and who the users were, how we could serve them better, stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's amazing to leverage some of the students in business school like that. Oh, yeah, the yeah they're, bril they're brilliant. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was unbelievable. So I had yeah. one one of my core mates, he worked in like online advertising and 
one of the first things he did was sit me down and just drew the site out on a piece of paper and said, you know, you need to have these specific ad units. You know, I don't know what you're doing right now, but and I listened to him, and that kind of helped us land that ad deal. So right there. Right. So, so the site had an ad-driven business model, and then fast forward to today when we're kind of living in the age of ad blockers and – you know, yeah, and we ad. saw that coming. I mean, specifically because because we've always been a community or forum based site, the click through rates on our banner ads have never been never been great. I mean, people I think since for many years have kind of had kind of ad blindness, right? They don't want to be interrupted. They don't want these big banner ads, or the and that's why ad blockers are so popular, right? So um, it's hard for online publishers. I think they're they're learning that you have to have either native products or native advertising within the content um, to actually be effective. And so right. um, we kind of saw that coming when I was at um, Wharton, we actually started releasing interview guides. Um, and so I was partnering with some, some talented authors that would help us kind of produce that content. And we started selling that. Um, and it was, that surprised me how popular it was. It was it was extremely popular. I feel like we had kind of built up a lot of goodwill over the years as pro providing this platform. So I feel like people were trying to support us. Um, but I also felt like we put out some good products and people wanted more. So uh, that's kind of that kind of opened my eyes to um, the potential of developing our own services and products. And from there, we um, launched a resume review service and a, uh, a mentor one-on-one -on -one service so people in specific industries or targeting specific jobs could get actual help one-on-one -on -one with a mentor in that industry. I thought it was great for like mock interviews. So if you had an interview coming up with XYZ firm, you could talk to somebody either at that firm um, or a related firm you know, right before your interview. And it was, um, I think, worth the cost for a lot of people because it's, it's one of the most nerve-wracking things right before you go into that interview room. You want to make sure you're polished. Absolutely. So you've moved away from this kind of crappy experience with ads no one wants to see. You got rid of all the ads on the site, and now you've created these really high-end products of guides for getting into banking and private equity, and so now you're selling these guides. And so that's the business model today Yeah, going I mean, it took, it took us, you know, to, be, to be fair, it took us a while to completely abandon third-party ads. Um, it, just because, you know, you get used to that revenue channel, it's hard to just completely cut it off. And, you know, the question was, Okay, if we if we put our own internal ads there, is it going to be enough enough to at least replace that revenue? Great. So, do you have big long term plans for the site now that a fancy MBA like yourself probably puts together? <laughs> I'm I'm kind of uh, it's it's tough. Sometimes I I have to get myself pull myself out of the weeds because I'm working with my web our web developers, our designers, and um, you know people like yourself you know, on the content side. I think there's there's so much more we could do and we could do better. I think. The platforms that are at a fairly good place right now, um, the design, we spent a lot of money last year on, on UX and UI design. I think it's much better than it had, has been in the past. I feel like where we really need to focus more of our efforts is on content and just um, really engaging the users with high quality content. So that's kind of where the idea of um, you know podcasting, reaching out to them in different channels such as this, but also... Um, just high, higher quality bloggers. Luckily, Uncle Eddie came back, so we have him back. We have um, some other great writers coming uh, down the pipe. So I feel like if we're focusing on, on good content, we have a great platform where there's a lot of engagement. I think kind of the rest takes care of itself. So so one of the top threads on, uh, on the site is about considering an MBA. You have some strong advocates for it. There are some people that argue against it. Um, it looks like your life has worked out pretty well, but would you do it again? What would you change? I would absolutely do it again, even though I kind of knew going in um, that I wasn't going to follow a traditional path necessarily to go back or to go into investment banking or back into private equity um, or management consulting. I felt like there was going to be enough smart people and it was going to build out my network enough where um, there'd be enough value there. There'd be enough people kind of... Um, you know, and I still tap the network all the time. We have people from Wharton coming in and doing webinars for our audience, so th that's been valuable as well. Um, but you know, I, I would definitely do it, and I think it, it's it's very much specific to um, a person's situation. So if it's somebody trying to make a career transition, the MBA is a great reset. If um, it's still not an easy transition, so if you don't have the pre-MBA experience, oftentimes you're up against students that do have that. So you need to be prepared, and I would say. Uh, more focused than what um, some people would tell you, because if you come into the MBA and you're kind of 
want to experiment, you're like, I'm going to do a little entrepreneurship, maybe private equity, maybe VC, maybe a little asset management, maybe some banking. Like it's it's going to be a lot harder to compete with the kids who are like, I want asset management, or I want hedge funds, or I, I definitely want banking and or management consulting. Is it, if you stretch yourself too thin, and there's a at Warren News say there's for, you know FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and if you stretch yourself too thin, joining 20 clubs and um, trying to be in every single professional club, I feel like that's where you can kind of go wrong because recruiting comes very fast. You have classes, you're having fun, you're meeting a lot of great people. So it's, um, I would say, yes, go, but make sure you kind of um, at least have narrowed down your options to, to more than just, or to, to less than two industry or less than three industries, ideally one or two, um, and kind right. of, and, and focus there. Um, and hopefully Wall Street yeah. Oasis is helpful in, in kind of determining what is a good fit for you. Yeah. I think that's kind of the main takeaway here is that Wall Street Oasis can be a great place to help, um, get information on stuff you're not sure about, unsure about, but I can uh, reaffirm that FOMO in business school is, is alive and real. That's uh, yeah. And I mean, I think you have to think about it as a life experience as well. I mean, think back in, in 20 or 30 years, are you going to be, are you going to regret having taken that two year, two years off to, to meet incredible people and, and travel and, um, kind of actually step back and think about where you're going? I don't think, I don't think so. I think, it's very rare that someone would say, would say I regret going. Um, so, you know, it's it's more than just you know what's the ROI on the degree. Um, even though I think for most people it's it's positive. Um, it's it's also are you enjoying your life, <laughs> right? So right. Um, <laughs> that and, and I think school. I think you almost appreciate school more when you're at this age than potentially when you were in college. Um, you know, I, th I feel like you actually enjoy the classes. You can take the classes that are most, most interesting to you. You can be exposed to some of the best professors in the world. So, you know, don't underestimate that. And, and, um, I feel like for me, a lot of the classes I took, the entrepreneurial classes was, um, incredibly enlightening in terms of, you know, everything from pricing to, you know, to more of the marketing side. I had no, I had no experience on that. So, um, it's helped me, um, dramatically, um, with, with, helping me make decisions in terms of where to grow the business, how to partner, how to negotiate all of these things, I think was extremely important, um, for the, for the success of uh, wall street oasis. So, yeah, I, I agree. So this has been great. I'll get you out of here on this. What's your 2017 goal? Do you have, do you have one thing you can point your finger to? You know, I have a lot of goals. I don't have one in particular for 2017. I think on a personal level, I want to make sure that I'm present with my family. I have a 20 month old uh, baby girl and I got a little boy on the way. So, uh, I know family is going to be uh, kind of a central focus for this year, um, for the site and for business in general. Um, I feel like always serving the community. I think content, content, content is this year. Um, last year was design and products. I think content is just kind of one of our main focuses this year. So we want to make sure that people, especially professionals and MBAs at this level, it's not just college students, but professionals actually find value, um, and want to come and contribute and, and make sure that the site, um, isn't just a, 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 an echo chamber. It actually has, you know, you know, experienced and, and, uh, professionals that, that are sharing their wisdom. Cause without that, it kind of, it, you get a bunch of college students talking to each other that are kind of giving their opinion, but it's, it's, I think a lot more valuable when you have people with experience there that have been there and, and lived it. So awesome. That's our focus. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you for listening to episode one. As I mentioned in the beginning, let us know what you think. You can email me, alex at wallstreetoasis.com. And yeah, thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with much more.